Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. The 117th session of Congress has now been sworn in and is underway. Nancy Pelosi won another term as Speaker of the House of Representatives, though the vote was close, 216 to 209 over Republican Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy. As of now, House Democrats have an 11-member majority, which out of a body of 435 members is actually one of the smallest majority majorities in recent years. Republican Mitch McConnell remains Senate Majority Leader for now, but we'll have to see what happens in Georgia as it is on the verge of deciding who its two senators will be. Either way, the Senate will also be practically evenly divided, creating an interesting dynamic for the first two years of a Joe Biden presidency. Now, the next big thing on Congress's docket is to count and certify the Electoral College vote for president and vice president on Wednesday. Usually a formality, but this year, about a dozen Republican senators, as well as a number of House Republicans, say that they plan to challenge several states' slate of electors. This is allowed, and as long as one senator and one member of the House challenge any state's slate of electors, they can force a debate and a vote on whether or not to accept votes from particular states. It's unlikely to work, as in order to throw out votes, there must be a majority in both the House and the Senate, which there probably won't be in either body come this Wednesday. Still, it does point to how fragile our electoral system can be, at least for the presidency. Concurrently, over the weekend, the Washington Post released an hour-long tape of a recent conversation that President Donald Trump had with Georgia's Republican Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, and others in trying to force Raffensperger to try to find Trump additional some 12,000 votes or so in order to give him the state of Georgia. Here is an excerpt from some of that phone call. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have. So, so tell me, Brad, what are we going to do? Uh, we won the election, and it's not fair to take it away from us like this. And it's going to be very costly in many ways. And I think you have to say that you're going to re-examine it, and you can re-examine it, but, but re-examine it with people that want to find answers, not people that don't want to find answers. Mr. President, uh, you have people that submit information, and we have our people that submit information, and then it comes before the court, and the court then has to make a determination. We have to stand by our numbers. We believe our numbers are right. Well, under law, you're not allowed to give faulty election results, okay? You're not allowed to do that, and that's what you've done. This is a faulty election result. And honestly, this should go very fast. You should meet tomorrow because you have a big election election coming up, and because of what you've done to the president, you know, the people of, of uh, Georgia know that this was a scam. And because of what you've done to the president, a lot of people aren't going out to vote. And a lot of Republicans are going to vote negative because they hate what you did to the president. Okay? They hate it. And they're going to vote. And if you would be respected, if really respected, if this thing could be straightened out before the election. You have a big election coming up on Tuesday. Again, that is tape released by the Washington Post of a conversation recently between President Donald Trump and Georgia's Republican Secretary of State, Brad Raffens. Raffensperger and several lawyers were also on that call. Well, today we are going to be in conversation about challenging the Electoral College vote. We're also going to be in conversation about the history, once again, of the Electoral College and a little bit about what this phone call that Donald Trump had recently means for this conversation. We're very happy to welcome to the program Edward B. Foley. Edward B. Foley holds the Ebersold Chair in Constitutional Law at Ohio State University, where he also directs its election law program. He is the author of the book, Presidential Elections and Majority Rule, The Rise, Demise, and Potential Restoration of the Jeffersonian Electoral College. He joins us via Skype. Edward Foley, I am very happy to welcome you to this program. Thank you for taking this time this morning, because I know, I know it's a busy time for you, a busy week for you, so thank you, sir. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I want to, you know, we, we asked you to come on because we wanted to talk mostly about the Electoral College. We want to talk about what's going to happen with this challenge on Wednesday. Some of the history that you really dive into uh, in your book. But uh, we've been upended a little bit by this phone call that has been released by the Washington Post between the uh, President Trump and the Georgia Secretary of State. 
What's your reaction to what we've heard in that what was really an hour long call? Well, it's very upsetting, you know, as somebody who believes strongly in America's democracy and the right of the voters to choose their leaders, you know, to have an incumbent president. I mean, he's been doing this prior to this call, but this call is an even more egregious attempt on his part to subvert the system, uh, to to overturn uh, the will of the people. Um, now, you can take it in two different ways. Um, you know, he he seems to believe that he won the state of Georgia. Uh, it, you know, it, it's if he really believes it, he, he's caught up in a delusion. It's a fantasy. It's just you know out of touch with reality. Um, and that's dangerous for a president, even one that only has two weeks left in office, to be that out of touch with reality. And and there'd be a kind of a sadness associated with that. Um, you know, if if this is all a lie, you know, and a deliberate lie on his part, you know, that's I guess even more morally repugnant. Um, you know, either way, it's just a terrible situation for our country to be in. And frankly, you know, as as damaging it is for an incumbent president to be behaving the way he is, it's the fact that he's got supporters with his own party. Um, now. And I haven't seen people react specifically to the phone call, but you mentioned Wednesday's vote. And, and we do know that a dozen Republicans in the Senate are planning to object. And their objection was in part based on, on President Trump's own prior claims that he believes the election is stolen, right? The, the Senator Cruz's um, characterization of why he wants to object is there needs to be an investigation into these allegations of fraud. Well, the allegations of fraud only exist because President Trump keeps harping on it, even though there's no evidence. So I think the, the danger to our country um, goes beyond this one taped conversation, as, as awful as that is, into thinking, how do we restore a healthy, competitive electoral system? Where, because for the system to be healthy, both major political parties have to believe in the rules and the values and have to be willing to accept defeat because the voters get to make the choice. And sometimes the voters as a whole will want the Democrats to win and sometimes they will want the Republicans to win. And that's their right in a competitive system. And unlike any prior election, you have the losing team refusing to accept defeat this time and then fabricating this alternative narrative, which, again, has no basis in reality, but it's because they can't admit defeat. Uh, that's not healthy. Uh, and we have to figure out as a society how to get, you know, get through this week, which is an important week, and then figure out how to restore our system going forward. I think that's really at the heart of the problem here. When you have a political system that Obviously, you only have two ruling parties, and when one of those two ruling parties is not ready to accept the outcome of an election, uh, that 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 is unnerving. And, yes, and what what I think, I mean, if you look at Senator Cruz's statement that he released, you know, over the weekend, I guess it was, um, you know, he talks the language of wanting to protect the integrity of the process. And the rule of law. And part of me wants to say, well, that's good. At least we share premises in terms of, you know, why we have a system of government and the will of the people. And yet, in some ways, you know, I say this hopefully with respect that Senator Cruz has it exactly backwards. I mean, the the undermining of the system is coming from these false allegations. Uh, you know, if there really was genuine evidence of wrongdoing in any of these states, such that there were, so the, the outcome was genuinely corrupted, you know, it would be essential for election law professors like myself to call that out in a nonpartisan, impartial way. You know, and we've had elections in the past that have needed recounts and, and uh, review of the ballots and so forth. Um, so those rules and procedures exist to protect the integrity of the system. But you, you can't just claim fraud and say it needs to be investigated because you claimed it. <laughs> there has to be some underlying 
basis for the allegation, and, and it just does not exist in this context. Before we dive into more what's going to happen on Wednesday with the counting of the Electoral College vote and certification of the vote, I want to ask you one last question concerning the tape we just heard uh, with Donald Trump and Georgia's Secretary of State. As a professor of election law, do you think what the president did was legal? I think you could make a strong case that it was uh, criminal in the sense that you could bring, bring a prosecution. Uh, my own view is that we should be very reluctant to go down that road, even assuming that there was a crime, precisely because our politics are so toxic at the moment with both sides treating each other as an enemy, you know, lock them up, lock her up. I mean, we need to de-escalate political tension, uh, I think, in order to get back to some normal mode of competition. Uh, and therefore, I don't think the healthy response is, how do we put somebody in jail for this behavior? I think the, the right way to think about this is, there needs to be a penalty or a consequence for this misbehavior because I think it was wrongful. And then the question is, what's the penalty and who should impose it? So, you know, again, I think we need to get through this week to protect our democracy. But going forward, you know, I, I think it is important to know that President Trump has talked about running again in 2024. Um, now, that would be his right if he was entitled to run. But I think this conduct disqualifies him from being a credible candidate, because you should not be the nominee of a major political party in the United States if you're unwilling to play by the rules. And you so disrespect the voters in the system that you don't really care what they do. You just have to have power because you want power. So I, I think this, frankly, disqualifies him from running in 2024. The question is, how should that consequence be uh, come about. Um, the better way for it to come about would be for the Republican Party to police itself and take it upon itself to say they can no longer tolerate the idea of having him as the leader of their party. If they want to be a responsible party in the American system of government, they need to have a nominee who respects the system. And uh, you know, and they're a large party. They have other leaders, and they have to say, you know, they've said this with with respect to uh, President Nixon. They all of them said, you know, we have to disown you, President Nixon. You just crossed the line. Um, they had to disown uh, Joe McCarthy for McCarthyism. Um, you know, I think it's reached the point where the Republican Party, for its own sake as well as for the sake of the nation, has to say this is too much and, and you can't be our leader anymore. Now, that's obviously, you know, I'm not naive. That's going to be very hard for the Republican Party. There are people who have already come out in favor of President Trump running again within the party. Now, that was before the phone call. But I think that's, and 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 if that happened, that would be healthy again for the party and for the system. If that doesn't happen and, you know, going forward, the Republican Party still looks to President Trump as its leader, even after this, you know, that's a really dangerous uh, consequence of where we are. And then I think we would have to say, well, how does the how does the country as a whole protect itself from that kind of situation? Can the Republican Party prohibit Donald Trump from from running? I mean, obviously, they could say we're not going to support you. If the votes aren't there, they aren't there. But Republicans don't have the full authority of how, how, how their base votes. Yeah, so um, this gets a little technical because, again, in our federal system of government, the national party is made up by the state party, and you you know you have to get on the ballot in each state and so forth. Um, but this has come up in the past. You know, when when people like David Duke you know, former member of the Ku Klux Klan tries to run for a major party nomination, the party has to announce saying, no, 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 you, you, you can't be a candidate for our nomination. Um, Lyndon LaRouche, I think, uh, presented this problem on the Democratic Party side. I, the, under the First Amendment, a political party is entitled to define itself uh, in terms of membership and ideology. There, again, are a little bit of complications in the rules because in addition to a political party being a, a, a private association with First Amendment autonomy, the, the electoral process of, of primary elections 
utilizing the machinery of government to run the elections means the government plays a role in who gets to be on the ballot and who gets to vote. You know, we had this awful history in America where, again, the Democratic Party in the South tried to be a whites-only party, and the U.S. Supreme Court appropriately said that that kind of racial discrimination, you know, had no place in the context of primary elections. So, um, but I, I think consistent with with those principles and the relevant uh, case law that exists and and rules uh, of law, I do think the Re Republican Party is entitled to define itself, what it stands for, and what's what's acceptable and what's unacceptable. And and given that, I would hope the Republican Party would think that that phone call was unacceptable, and uh, and therefore there would be consequences within the party itself for that conduct having taken place. It'd be remarkable for a party to tell its former president that it could not run for president. I mean, I think of like precedent here, maybe maybe Nixon, though Nixon didn't try to run again for president. Maybe, I don't know, this is very different, but I, I can't help but also think about Teddy Roosevelt when he ran on a third party, when he was unable yeah. to secure the nomination with the Republican Party in the early part of the 20th century. Yeah, I think the the point about Nixon's a, a, an important one in that, um, you know, the Watergate crimes were election related. You know, they occurred in the run up to the 1972 re-election. It was kind of amazingly ridiculous because that was such a landslide against McGovern. Um, but the whole prosecution of Watergate occurred during Nixon's second term after he had been reelected and won that line slide, which meant under the 22nd Amendment, he was disqualified for running a third third term. You know, and my own assessment of this, for what it's worth, is um, I've thought that the biggest challenge to our democracy this in the year 2020 was the, the um, things surrounding impeachment in the Ukraine phone call. You know, as much as COVID put a stress on the implementation of the system, that was logistical. You know, the pandemic, I don't want me to under, undermine the significance of the pandemic for our society, our health, for everything. But as a matter of running the election, the pandemic's challenge was how do we get ballots into voters' hands? How do we actually, how do we do this? The challenge of the Ukraine phone call was how do we, because unlike Nixon with Watergate, when it was after that victory of the second term, Ukraine, you know, occurred during Trump's first term as he was planning to run in November 2020. And we had never had in American history an, a first term president trying to subvert the electoral process to try to guarantee his own reelection victory, even if not by appropriate means. And so he got impeached for that. And Speaker Pelosi said initially impeachment had to be bipartisan. And I think she was right about that. It didn't end up being bipartisan. And so when it came time for the Senate to vote on impeachment, there was cleavage essentially between the two parties. Only Senator Romney, you know, voted to convict. And so that polarization over the Ukraine phone call was a very difficult dynamic for our country that we've never had before. And, you know, we had the November election. You know, in fact, one of the most important points, at least that I observed, is you had Senator Lamar Alexander exercising a leadership role during the Senate trial, saying the Ukraine phone call was wrong, but the remedy here is not removal from office. The remedy is to let the voters decide. The voters should be the one to judge President Trump and whether he gets a second term or not. And I actually thought that was a fair point, given that dynamic. But the implication of that meant the Republican Party needed to accept the verdict in November. Now, some Republicans like Senator Alexander have, and Senator McConnell has, maybe a little bit later than desirable, but he came out emphatically after the Electoral College vote in December saying it's done. But what's dangerous about what Senator Hawley is doing and what Senator Cruz and others are doing, and frankly, what Trump is leading, is this refusal to accept what we could call the Lamar Alexander principle, right? We gave you, Mr. President, a second chance to show that you could play by the rules. 
But that meant the voters get to decide in our system of self-government. What's Trump's response? I refuse to accept the will of the voters. And in order to, to make a narrative out of it, I'm going to fabricate this alternative account, trying to claim that I am the true representative of the will of the voters. Just not true. You can try to make it up, but it doesn't make it true. And and for Senators Cruz and, to, and Senators Hawley to kind of buy into that false narrative, that's what's so dangerous. It is interesting to think about the similarities and the connection between what happened with this phone call with Georgia's uh, Secretary of State and the phone call that happened more than a year ago between uh, Trump and uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky in trying to get the investigation into Joe Biden from, from Ukraine. Yeah, this one's worse, I think, for, I mean, you know, we're on, you know, grades of wrongdoing. But the reason why I say that is that um, the Ukraine interference was about the dynamic of the campaign. It was like outsourcing, um, you know, uh, attack ads, you know, they, they, in other words, they wanted Ukraine to, to find dirt on Biden that would affect public opinion, you know, terrible, shouldn't have happened. But the Georgia phone call is is seeking fabrication of the returns, you know, falsification. I mean, it is a, in a way the functional equivalent of ballot box stuffing, um, and 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 so that's a more direct attack on democracy, even than the Ukraine phone call was. This is Letters on Politics, and we are in conversation with Edward B. Foley. He holds the Everson Chair in Constitutional Law at Ohio State University, where he also directs the university's election law program. He's the author of the book, Presidential Elections and Majority Rule, The Rise, Demise, and Potential Restoration of the Jeffersonian Electoral College. Professor Foley, I certainly appreciate you for uh, entertaining us about the conversations with the, the Trump's phone call uh, to Georgia uh, officials. The, the reason we originally invited you on, because we invited you on before that tape came out, was to talk about what was going to happen on Wednesday and, and, some, and diving into more of the history of the Electoral College. So let's begin with what happens on Wednesday. The Constitution mandates that on January 6th, uh, the United States Congress counts the Electoral College vote uh, and then, then certifies it. Uh, this is usually a formality, even though we saw in 2004 there was a challenge uh, when our own senator here at California at the time, Barbara Boxer, was the one senator, uh, along with a, a House representative from uh, Ohio, uh, challenged the slate of electors that came in from Ohio, but still not a very common occurrence. So what's happening on Wednesday and why is it important, even if no one still thinks the Republicans are going to be successful in changing the outcome of the election? Well, it is important to get the congressional confirmation of the Electoral College result. Uh, the Constitution, as you say, requires it. So even if it should be ceremonial and usually as a formality, it's still, you know, we it, in a rule of law society, you need that official proclamation. And and there's sort of two parts to the Electoral College process. Uh, the first part occurs in the states. That's when the electors themselves meet and cast their votes. And the Constitution requires that to be the same day all around the country. And so that was December 14. Congress can pick the day. So last, you know, just last month, it was December 14. And that's, you know, there that has an official status in and of itself. And again, we, we have to remember this is all a product of the 18th and 19th century in a different telecommunication. I mean, they didn't have telecommunication. They had the printing press and they had horse and buggy. Um, and so they needed to figure out how to transmit the results from Virginia and New York and Pennsylvania, you know, to the seat of government, and, you know, became Washington, D.C. Uh, and, and so when Congress met in the nation's capital, they had to make sure they were receiving the authentic pieces of paper coming from the states. They didn't have TV cameras watching the process. Um, and so, so it was structured as, you know, first the electoral college in each state meets and votes, and then they send their certificates of their own votes to Congress. And that's what gets opened up in a special joint session as you say, it's on January 6th, this, this Wednesday. Uh, but, but it's important, I think, to understand the limited role that Congress plays. And the way to understand that is to try to put one's 
mind back into the 18th and 19th century and the relationship of state government to the national government. I mean, again, I think we have some sense that we have these sovereign states of California and Virginia and New York, but that sense of state sovereignty, again, before the Civil War, was, was more robust. And, and, and the Constitution, whether we like it or not, and I'm all for amending the Constitution to get rid of the Electoral College, because I think it is antiquated, but we, we have to abide by the rules. And the, the fundamental design of the system was states are in control of their own electoral votes. Article two of the U.S. Constitution says each state legislature can choose the manner of appointing the state's electors. Now, we're lucky enough as citizens that all the states have chosen a popular vote as the method of appointing electors. Um, that gives more you know, input from you and I and everybody else, but that's not a constitutional necessity. Um, in the old days, legislatures, state legislatures could appoint electors directly. They still could have the constitutional power to do that. The U.S. Supreme Court has said that in Bush versus Gore and elsewhere. Um, now, again, thankfully, every state held a popular vote this past November. Um, but structurally, what that popular vote does is it, pursuant to state law, is it results in the appointment of electors. And, and that's all done under state law. The only role for Congress on January 6th is to ask and answer the question, do we have a package of electoral votes coming from people who are the true electors of that state? Are these the people that the state has actually appointed? If the answer to that question is yes, Congress's job is over. Because Congress doesn't recount the popular vote, because there might not have been a popular vote if there had been another method of appointment. Congress just has to make sure it doesn't have fraudulent packages or, you know, rival packages that don't have official status. So Congress's job is not to correct a mistake that Georgia might have made in applying its own laws. Congress says, do we know who Georgia has appointed? to be Georgia's electors? The answer to that question is undoubtedly yes. We know that Georgia appointed individuals who happen to vote for Joe Biden for president. There's no doubt about that. President Trump seems to think that Georgia made a mistake in that appointment. Not true, but even if it were true, that was Georgia's mistake for Georgia to correct before December 14 under the Constitution. Georgia did appoint electors. It was those people who voted for Biden. There is no role for Congress to second guess what Georgia actually did. That's interesting. And that's interesting to think about Congress's role and, and maybe lack of a role in determining how the popular vote in a state went. It's concern, I think, as you indicate, and you'll correct me if I'm misunderstanding, is actually just in the electoral votes themselves. Um, we, we have had in the past, it's been a long time, uh, a slate of electors thrown out from several states in, in a single election. If we go back to 1876 between Rutherford B. Hayes and Samuel Tilden, um, very, in some ways very similar to what's happening now. There were allegations of voter fraud and then also voter, voter suppression. Um, what, what, was that appropriate, what happened in, in 1876? I mean, what, why did they throw out those votes? Yeah, so I do think it's very important to talk about 1876. Um, it is our most contentious presidential election in, in history, even more than Florida 2000 and Bush versus Gore. Um, but I think it's important to understand that the dispute then was genuine in a way that the dispute now is not. I do think Senator Cruz and his group of 11 or so are trying to make that a parallel. They're trying to say, hey, we need a commission now the way they had a commission then. And there were allegations of fraud then, there are allegations of fraud now. But it's a, it's a false equivalence in the following sense. Um, the, the, dis, the dispute between Hayes and Tilden in the midst of Reconstruction was very real. I mean, there was horrific disenfranchisement of African-American voters in the South in violation of the 15th Amendment. That's been documented by historians. And um, had there not been that uh, 
uh, disenfranchisement, Hayes would have won clearly. So the Hayes team had a genuine grievance. On the other hand, um, the Republicans who controlled the canvassing boards during Reconstruction in the southern states committed their own form of election fraud by deliberately miscounting the, the tally of the ballots that were actually cast. Um, and that's also been documented. And so the Tilden folks were crying foul with respect to the counting process. So, so there was really stuff to fight about, and they took that fight to Congress. The other thing that was true is because the fight was genuine, it was genuinely contested who was entitled to speak for the disputed states. So Florida, again, was in play back, back then. And so you had the Hayes electors having official status under Florida law on one theory of Florida law, and you have the Tilden electors having official status under Florida law under a different theory of Florida law. And so Congress actually did need to figure out whose theory of Florida law was correct to identify who Florida's electors were. That's different from trying to recalibrate the popular vote. The commission never tried to do that back in 1876. Congress never tried to do that. All they tried to do is, is figure out who gets to speak for the state of Florida as Florida's electors. We don't have the equivalent of that here insofar as, you know, there are people in Arizona and maybe some of the other states who say they want to be alternative electors, but they never got any official backing from any organ of state government. So, um, and another part of the, the, Congress really was faced with a very difficult situation in 1876 because because the claims on both sides were real and the Republicans controlled the Senate and the Democrats controlled the House, given that situation, you had deadlock in Congress. You had, because the Senate wanted to say Hayes was the winner and the House wanted to say Tilden was the winner. Well, you can't have two winners. And so the only way they could resolve that impasse was some sort of commission. Thankfully, we don't have that kind of impasse now. Um, when when Senator McConnell announces that he respects Biden's victory, we now know that both the Senate and the House are going to, on Wednesday, it may take a while because of the objections and so forth, but the end result is going to be the Senate and the House agreeing that it's President Biden and Vice President Harris. And so there's no need for a commission to adjudicate a conflict between the Senate and the House. So while you're right, we should all understand the history of Hayes Tilden. It's a you know really tragic piece of American history because it ended Reconstruction and led to Jim Crow. And you know there's so much there to to learn from. Um, but it's wrong to say that our situation today is a replica of that situation back then. I'm not a historian, nor am I a scholar. I'm just a radio guy. So if I get any of this wrong, you will correct me. My understanding of what happened in 1876 also includes one party uncomfortable with the role that the vice president would have in this, in, in this process of counting the vote, of actually opening and selecting what slate of electors would be counted in that election. We have seen word from the vice president. You'll correct me if I'm wrong on any of that. But bringing it to today, we have seen word from the vice president's office that he does support these challenges happening. Is there is there any kind of concern about uh, Mike Pence overseeing this process? Yeah, so let me take that in parts because there's a lot of important um, aspects to that. Uh, the first point, and it's a little tricky, but I think it's worth unpacking, the Constitution talks about the Senate president um, opening the packages that come from the states in this special joint session of Congress. I say that term Senate president um, because that's what the Constitution says. Now, it is true the Constitution also says that when you have a vice president, the vice president is the Senate president. But actually, back in 1876, the vice president had died and not been replaced. So the Senate president at the time was what we call Senate 
pro tem or pro tempore. It was a member of the Senate. His name was Thomas Ferry, happened to be a Republican, um, sitting in that role. Um, and in fact, in 1969, if I'm getting my history again correct, even though um, Hubert Humphrey, who had been the candidate on the Democratic Party side and been defeated, you know, it would have been his role. He was on a, a, a attending a funeral overseas on behalf of the American government, so he did not preside. And it, again, it was the Senate President Pro Tem. Um, now, so Mike Pence presumably will preside because he is the Senate President in his in that capacity. But it's not like the Vice President has some independent authority here. It's that the Senate President plays a distinctive role. And I'm not, uh, I mean, my field is election law. There are experts in congressional procedure that I would defer to. But I think there's a argument that that the Senate president is, is a creature in a way of that body. In other words, the Senate president acts on behalf of the Senate. And so when the Senate president presides on Wednesday, he's doing it on behalf of the Senate. And that has some important technical features in terms of the rules and the procedures to be followed. Now, you're right, historically, given that the, the Hayes-Tilden fight was so contentious, the Hayes supporters tried to push the claim that the Senate president or, you know, pro tempore had some constitutional power to run the show that the other side resisted. For our purposes today, it's important to understand that the statute that Congress adopted in the aftermath of that dispute, which is called the Electoral Count Act, it's from 1887, and they took a decade to figure out what they wanted after the Hayes-Tilden fight, but they came up with a set of procedures that are very much designed to minimize the Senate president's role or Pence's role. Yes, he chairs the meeting, but he's not supposed to be decisive. He's not supposed to control the outcome. Um, so, and and I, I saw the statement that his office released in the last day or so. And you know, while it's a little bit unclear, he talked about the procedures happening under the law. And I took that as a as a signal. You know, maybe I'm reading more into it that's there. But 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 if it, if this is the correct reading, it's a. I think it's a good sign that he feels obligated to run the meeting on on the sixth pursuant to law, um, because we do have the law does describe a set of procedures. Now it does allow for these objections. I, I think I think the objections are a misuse of the process. Uh, we could talk about why, but 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 one senator and one representative is all it takes to trigger an objection. Uh, and so the, if an objection occurs, it will require debate and a decision on the objection. Uh, you could say, I could say that the objection shouldn't have been brought and to bring it was a misreading of the Congress's role. But if, a, if an objection exists, it has to be dealt with. I mean, it's their right to bring an objection. Depends on, yes. They, I mean, they have that power. I would say that they have a responsibility to only bring objections that are appropriate under the Constitution and the law. And given what we were saying earlier, I don't think it is appropriate to bring an objection claiming that the state miscounted its own popular vote, even if the miscount was based on claims of fraud in the popular vote. I think, I mean, the, this very same statute that gives a senator and a representative the right to object talks about Congress accepting is conclusive, that's the statute's word, conclusive, any final determination, that's also the statute's word, final determination of any adjudication that occurs within state courts of any litigation over the popular vote and the appointment of electors. So, the, so, so this law, this Electoral Count Act that was adopted in 1887, Congress has given its pledge to the states again, understanding its role in the Constitution, to say, look, if you look into allegations of fraud, if you investigate that, if you litigate that, whatever final answer you have, we'll accept that conclusively. It's binding on us in Congress in all of our proceedings under the Electoral Count Act. 
if you take that language seriously, as I think they should, it's inappropriate to object based on that the state's final determination didn't go correctly. They're supposed to accept that final determination as final and not second guess it. Now, the implication of that, I'm, you know, I have to say, was that the objection that Senator Boxer did in, in 2005 was equally inappropriate, should not have happened, was an abuse of the process, was, was ir I, would, I would say, irresponsible as well as incorrect. Again, the senator is entitled to do that, meaning that if they do it, it has to be considered. But, but I think they each member of Congress owes a duty under the law to do it properly. Uh, and I would say it was improper then, and it's improper for Senator Hawley and, and, and Senator Cruz to do it now. Barbara Boxer was challenging uh, the state that you're in, Ohio. What, was, there, was there no irregularities worth looking into that happened in 2004, in your opinion? Oh, there were terrible irregularities in Ohio in 2004. You know, there was excruciatingly long lines and, and other problems. Um, I guess two key points about that. Um, you know, one, none of the uh, irregularities amounted to uh, the declaration that Bush won Ohio and that Kerry lost Ohio was an incorrect result. Right. And, it's, you know, the, the Bush's margin of victory in, in Ohio in 2004 was over 100,000 votes, close to 120,000 votes. And, and I think a, a, genu a generous, uh, you know, calculation of the irregularities could have put it at 50,000 or 60,000 votes. So that's massive. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I don't want to minimize for a moment the problems that occurred. I was watching that very closely. Um, but uh, honesty require, you know, as, as someone who studies the electoral process and tries to be nonpartisan, the amount of problems in Ohio did not achieve an incorrect outcome. Uh, so that's point number one. Uh, but point number two is, again, if Ohio looked into its own result. There were, you know, there were Ohio utilized recount and contest and other litigation procedures. Um, Kerry admitted conceded defeat. He thought about litigating, and he said, no, 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 it's outside the marginal litigation. So he conceded Wednesday morning. Um, but there were individual voters. Um, there might have been a third-party candidate, I'd have to, um, that actually triggered you know, the formal litigation process in the state of Ohio. Um, so that was looked into by the legal system in Ohio. And it, it was adjudicated that the, the result wasn't, you know, the bottom line result of whether Bush won or Kerry won, it was an accurate result. And that adjudicated occur, occurred by the so-called safe harbor deadline under the Electoral Count Act, meaning that if Ohio completed its proceeding, that final determination by the required date, um, that was to be accepted by Congress as absolutely final. So, um, so given that, it was the job of Congress to say, okay, Ohio's looked into this, Ohio has appointed its electors. Congress was simply supposed to accept those electors. If Congress wanted to hold hearings on election irregularities and improve elections for the future, absolutely okay to do that. But the joint session of Congress to accept and count electoral votes, that's not an appropriate legislative place for hearings about how to fix the future. The, the sole purpose of that proceeding is to say, do we know who Ohio has appointed its electors? Answer emphatically, yes. Okay, we have the official electors from Ohio. We count their votes. So that's why, you know, my own analysis is that it was inappropriate for Senator Boxer to do what she did. I, I don't mean to make you repeat what you've said probably a few <laughs> times in the course of this conversation, but I, I do want to just get extreme real clarity here about the problem and the concern you have with these challenges. If Barbara Boxers, I think it was Cynthia Tubbs Jones, who was the Ohio representative? Stephanie Tubbs. Stephanie, Stephanie oh, forgive me. Yeah. Yeah. That's what happens when you do these things off the top of your head. Mm -hmm. Stephanie Tubbs Jones and, and Barbara Boxer, their, their challenge in no way threatened the election, the re election of George Bush in 2004. It doesn't appear that the challenge that is happening on this Wednesday is going to uh, overturn the results. So if it is within their rights to bring these challenges 
and it doesn't appear that it's going to actually change the outcome. What what are you most concerned about in that in that process? Are you concerned that in the future this leads to a point? Because it is pretty remarkable. You only need a majority in each body, if I'm correct, to throw a slate of electors out. Um, kind of that's something that's kind of glared at me in, during this whole process. But clearly, we're not there yet. Are, do, you, do you worry that one day we will we will be there? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, I think, and in fact, the the fact that the Republicans this year are citing the Barbara Boxer example as well as what Democrats did to Trump's electoral votes in 2017, which again was inappropriate for the same reason. They're, they're saying, hey, we've set a precedent and now it's okay to do this sort of thing. Um, well, that could happen four years from now, but be outcome determinative. Um, you know, I mean, it's not, not difficult to imagine Senator Hawley being the Republican nominee, you know, winning Wisconsin as the pivotal state Democrats claiming voter suppression was the only reason for that victory. And, and in Congress, if they hold the House, saying, well, we're just not going to acknowledge the Senator Hawley's victory in Wisconsin, and we're not going to count his electoral votes. I mean, this is really playing with fire, I think. Um, I mean, we should get back to, you know, we should either, again, get rid of the Electoral College, come up with a new system that we can abide by and believe in and say this is a good way to elect a president and count votes for president and so forth. But until we do that, we have to kind of run the system according to how it's supposed to operate. And it's not supposed to operate with Congress, again, second guessing what the states have done to appoint their electors. Uh, that's for the states to do. Um, and, and, you know, I think Senator Hawley is wrong. You know, Senator Hawley says, well, we have to look into what Pennsylvania did. Pennsylvania might have violated its own laws. Well, that's Pennsylvania's problem. If the, again, if the, if the legislature of Pennsylvania had actually done what President Trump asked for, which was, you know, if the legislature of Pennsylvania had said that the vote counting process had gone so awry or the vote cast, you know, the, the electoral process was such shambles that we can't trust the outcome of the popular vote. And so we, the, the legislature, have to directly appoint electors. That would have set up the Hayes-Tilden type situation, because then you would have had the governor submitting, saying, hey, we've certified the popular vote, Biden won the popular vote, so that's what we think is our electoral votes. But the legislature would have said, no, 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 can't trust the popular vote anymore, and we, are, the legislature, are empowered under the Constitution to appoint electors. You know, that would have required Congress to say, well, who do we believe, the legislature of Pennsylvania or the governor of Pennsylvania, as to who gets to appoint electors? But we, we don't have that situation. Um, and again, it's not for Congress to police the internal operation of Pennsylvania law. That's for Pennsylvania courts or Pennsylvania legislature. Pennsylvania decided what it wanted, and Pennsylvania has sent that decision to Congress. So it's over. Yeah. And it's wrong for Senator Hawley to revisit that. We're almost out of time, so I'll end with this. I guess I see us in this interesting point in time in which we can go in two directions. Either one, we can continue down this trajectory, down this road of maybe in a few years' time, we could have a Congress that would change the outcome of an Electoral College election. Or, on the other side, maybe with the countless legal pursuits that judges uh, uh, ruled against the Trump campaign and trying to change the outcome, the legislatures, the Republican-controlled legislatures that refused to step in and, and select their own slate of electors. And now, even though there'll be an attempt on Wednesday, it'll be a failed attempt uh, to change the outcome. Maybe this will set the precedent of, okay, this isn't worth going down again. You know, four, eight years from now, they may say, well, we could try doing that. Yeah, but it didn't work before. So there's no use trying that again. Well, uh, you know, we, we're trying to crystal ball the future. Yes. Maybe, you know, if we're lucky enough, we could have another conversation down the road and see how, see how we're doing. Um, uh, you know, I still, again, we have to get through this, this Wednesday, uh, you know, and come out on the other side with democracy intact, a, a, bit, a little bit bruised, unfortunately, but hopefully still intact, and then begin the process of, of rebuilding and healing the body politic. Edward B. Foley has been our guest. Again, he holds the Ebersold Chair in Constitutional Law at the Ohio State University. 
He also directs its election program there. He's the author of the book, Presidential Elections and Majority Rule, The Rise, Demise, and Potential Restoration of the Jeffersonian Electoral College. Professor Foley, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you for taking this time. I've enjoyed it as well. Thank you.